Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection as usual. Um, today we'd like to tell you about uh, many theorems actually, or more like a class of very nice objects, which are called Riemann surfaces. So named after, well, the person called Riemann here. So one of the uh, major figures in mathematics over the last 200, in the last 200 years. Um, so really, really brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So usually Riemann is the type of person who writes very, very short papers with a lot of really cool content. And here's another one of them. And um, so Riemann surfaces nowadays kind of are everywhere in mathematics for various reasons, but I'm trying to sketch, but I'm trying to motivate them uh, following history. So what the original motivation for the Riemann surfaces was. Um, and I think it's really related to this idea that choices are really bad. So choices, you never you never should have choices, right? If you don't have a choice, you will just do what needs to be done. And if you have a choice, you will just think a long time, or at least I will, <laughs> just think for a long time, what should I do? Should I do A or should I do B? It probably doesn't matter, and I just waste a lot of time. Anyway, so in mathematics, you certainly don't want any choices. Choices are somehow bad in some sense, because it, then it means whatever you do is not canonical in a certain way. Okay, fine, fair enough. And here, that's kind of the idea we want to avoid choices. And the best way to illustrate that is to use a very, very simple function, which is my square root of x function. So just a real square root function. And yeah, so if you know the picture of the square root function, it's usually the half of what is drawn here, something like this upper half. But really, uh, square root has two solutions. So really the function is more like this on the side line parabola, the red one. And we kind of don't like that so because it's now a multi-valued function. And for some reasons, people decided a long time ago that multi-valued functions are not great. So functions usually just have one output. So they're never multi-valued. So it's just whatever, you just assign X to Y, for example. Um, but here you have can assign x to y or to minus y, essentially. Uh, as you can see here, there are two choices what to do with x. And that's a multi-valued function. And in some sense, we don't like that. Um, and usually people resolve that in a really, really not good way by just making a choice. So for example, you take the upper half of the curve and define that as the square root function. Um, and the whole idea, under there are many, many, many more multivalued functions. Logarithm is a horrible example, or a good example, whatever you want to call it. There's just so many choices involved in trying to define logarithms. Anyway, um, so square root is kind of the easiest one. And we really don't like choices. It's kind of weird. So here in this picture, why on earth should we prefer the upper half over the lower half? Or, well... Any other crazy choice that just jumps you through um, the the curve here? Uh, why, why should we have a choice anyway? Can, can't we just take the whole curve? So we need to do something here. And the something will be a Riemann surface. So the Riemann surface will be kind of a reprimatization of the plane, if you want, such that our square root function or any other multi-valued function um, is now definable without ambiguity. And that's a pretty cool idea. So here I said again, square root has this problem. So let's call it the problem of a choice. And we don't like that. And so I said again, so why should the upper half be better than the lower half? To me, they look exactly the same. One of them is just draw, draw, drawn uh, to the top, one of them is just drawn to the bottom, but that's essentially it. So we want to avoid that. And it's actually not so easy. So if you, so kind of, um, the history here is a little bit that uh, mathematics for a long time was mostly number theory and analysis and roughly in the time when Riemann was very active, which was 1840, 1850-ish, um, complex analysis was really, really popular. So the first thing you would try is to extend uh, the square root to the complex plane. And sure, you can take the square root of a complex number. That's no problem. But again, you run into some problems that you don't like. Uh, so there will be a half line. No, no matter what kind of choices you make, there will be a half line 
where you run into problems. And I will show you in a second in an animation why there's a half line. Uh, so just in the animation, we will have this function here. So we want to solve x squared is equal to a, and a will be varied times, well, i is just square root of minus 1. Let's say a choice of square root of minus 1, uh, namely the one that sits here on um, the, well, this is a complex plane, on the complex plane. And I perturbed it a little bit, but you can actually ignore this minus 0 0.1. So let's have a look. So what do I would like to uh, look at, and as soon as I start the animation, is that there will be kind of a jump. So there will be no continuous extension of any type of choice, which now is really bad. So for the square root in the compl and the real uh, plane, it was kind of OK. There might be, you might argue, OK, it's 0, it's not differentiable. But otherwise, it's kind of a really nice smooth curve. But here it gets really bad. So whatever kind of choice you make, there will be some problem involved. So that's, that's really bad. So that, let's have a look at the animation. So here's the animation. It's really, really simple. I just have the two roots here of uh, this function here, and I can vary a and make do this in a second. What I would like to uh, you to look out for is the usual choice of the complex square root is a solution, which in this case is this one here with a, a positive real part. So this is a negative real part. This is a positive real part. So usually we would choose this solution. Um, if you would choose this solution, the problem will be the same. But now let's focus just on we're choosing this solution here. So I can vary a, and as you will see, the I move it very slowly, and the roots move continuously. So that's fine, kind of, and move continuously around. But here something funny happens for a around zero. So a here goes from um, minus one to one, and we're roughly around zero already. So what happens here for a equals zero is fun. So let's look at this one here. So this is our choice right now. So we don't like this one. The, the bottom one is our choice. And if we move that a little bit further, there will be a jump around zero. And now the top one is our choice. Right? So in the bottom one is not the one. So we jump from the bottom one to the top one, which is a non-continuous operation. And whatever kind of choice you do, you can never avoid that. So you always have kind of a jump uh, in the, the square root function. And that's that's really a little bit bad. And the Riemann surface is now the following idea. So in this case for square root, so this is the Riemann surface for the square root function, you just take this subset of the complex plane. So two points, z and w, and well, w squared is z. In other words, uh, w is the square root of z, right? So w should be the square root of z. And on this function, so if I now consider my square root function is starting in S and going to um, the complex plane, then it's not multivalued anymore. So I got rid of the choice of uh, multivalued, uh, kind of making to have a choice here, which is pretty cool. So it's now single valued on S. And that's the whole point to introduce Riemann surfaces. You get rid of the choices and you have a topological geometric object actually associated to a function. So here's how the surface looks like. It's a bit hard to illustrate because it secretly is C squared, which because you double everything, real um, C is twice real, right? C, if you want, is twice the real numbers. Whatever that means, you know what that means, right? So C is this plane and it's twice the real numbers. So C squared is actually four times the real numbers. So this is actually four dimensional. It's a bit hard to illustrate. So here's a three-dimensional picture, and it works as follows. So the two horizontal axes represent the real and imaginary parts of Z, and the well vertical axis is the real part of square root of Z, and the missing dimension is encoded in color. But the, let's ignore the missing dimension. As you can see, that's kind of a beautiful surface. Um, you still have something going on around this line that we had before, but otherwise, it's a really beautiful um, and very continuous and very smooth type of, of surface. And the point is, we don't have to make any choices anymore. So choices are gone. And you can define that for absolutely any uh, multivalued function. So here, for example, would be the Riemann surface for logarithm. So logarithm is pretty complicated as an object. So as you can see here, if you want, if I stack 
mm, something through in this direction and this just looks silly. Let's say I poke it here and I poke it here somewhere. Then this would be my two, 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 the two values of the square root. And for the logarithm, you just have infinitely many kind of values. So you just stack it through, stack it through, stack it through, and it just winds around forever. So the, <laughs> the logarithm is a kind of a really badly behaved multivalued function. Anyway, so the definition in the end um, of a Riemann surface is really just a surface in the topological way, but with some uh, complex analytic functions involved, which I'm not going to explain. But the point is, kind of Riemann surfaces are extremely nice. And you can, for example, classify them. Um, I show you a classification on the next slide. And there are actually two different ones. And depending a little bit of what type of mathematics you're into, you will meet the either of them, or maybe you actually be both. So first, this one here for multivalued functions, they're usually non-compact. As you can see, it's just, it just doesn't fit in the box. Com compact just means it fits into a box, but this function is infinite, so it doesn't fit uh, infinite in one direction, so it doesn't fit into a box. And here, a compact one, uh, the sphere, for example, fits very nicely into a box, actually. Uh, so that's a compact surface. And then you get very different flavors here for Riemann surfaces, depending on how you would like to study them, but you would always like to think of them as being associated to a function and you get rid of the choice of being multivalued. And the point is you have so many classification theorems for surfaces, for example, the, um, the uh, compact ones, the closed compact ones, so closed is just without boundary and compact, and they're classified as follows, they're just tori, or I, I'm missing the sphere, the sphere was on the previous slide, so the sphere, a yeah, torus, a double torus, a triple torus. So actually not so many choices, which is pretty cool. So kind of they're kind of very rigid and very rich object objects at the same time. And for example, they come because they have some analytic something going on, and they come with a various types of metrics, and there are only three of them, which is either parabolic or elliptic, which essentially just are those two, and everything else is hyperbolic. That's a pretty cool classification. So if you know the analog classification topology where you don't have um, the complex analytic functions going around here, for example, they're always un uh, orientable using the complex analytic structure. Anyway, so I try to motivate Riemann surfaces following history by resolving um, kind of the ambiguities of multivalued functions. So you, there are certain surfaces which usually live in something like a four space, and they are designed in such a way that your multivalued function may be the square root or the third root or the cube root or the fourth root, fifth root, whatever, or the log or something, that there will be single valued on this surface. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.